Okay. Here we go. So welcome back to the Song of Songs. Um, we left off last time in chapter four, which is where we'll pick up. And last time, probably trying to get too much in, probably just to the left, this little section until now. And so we're going to start it again and flesh this last section of chapter four. You know, this is our third session in chapter four, which I just didn't expect it to be this long, but it's wonderful, isn't it? That it is, you know, it's absolutely delicious, and beautiful. And so we've already prayed, but once again, just pray to you, Lord, that this will affect us. You know, you're calling people to yourself and you're liking it to a bride who is spotless and without blemish, incorrupted from this world, free from the love of this world. Dove's eyes only for you. That's what we want to come out of this with, Lord. Thank you that the Spirit's here to help and to do this work in us. So really, soon, as I recite my composition, it's in the King and the Bride in the Making, then let my tongue as the pen of a ready writer. Amen. Amen. Because Amen. we finished in chapter four and it's our third session in chapter four. And it has been in three sort of sections in a way where the first part was all a description of her appearance, wasn't it? Eyes and teeth and lips and so on. And then more into the fragrances last week, you know, the fragrances and the, the, the real core verse, I would say, is verse nine, which we've looked at. But it's you have ravished my heart, my sister spouse. We looked at that last time, the Abraham Isaac connection, the family connection, the fact that it's all by Yeshua being our brother. You know, it's this language, but the spouse is irresistible. Mm -hmm. Kala is the Hebrew, Kala, which I think it did again say last time, comes from the, the word to complete. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the word Kala and complete are the same, same word. When Moshe completed the way Kala of the tabernacle, he raised it up. It's the same word, and so you can see what being a bride is. It's being complete. And we are complete in him, but we've got to learn how we to walk in this freedom of the Spirit, mm -hmm. the Lord of the Spirit, you know. So, uh, you have ravished my heart, my sister spouse. Um, For, sorry, it was verse seven, but it's the same language. You are all fair, my love, and there's no spot in you. This is so irresistibly clear and obvious that it's Messiah speaking to his pure and spotless bride, which is what the whole work of sanctification is about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So we've done all of that. And then really we're going to start now in verse 12. So it's only, as you can see, a few verses to finish chapter four. But, you know, I've got... Wonderful notes to read through. I want to be faithful to the notes because I know the good notes that have been accumulated. As I've said, reading wonderful commentators throughout the years, you agree and disagree, and just a great debate to begin, and wonderful things to think about. So I'll throw things up like this to consider. But the first verse then is uh, moving on from all of the other descriptions. Now it's a garden. It's, what a description this is, you know, really, as we look at it tonight, a garden enclosed or a garden locked is my sister spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. This language is delicious. I, th I think the word is beautiful, isn't it? And so I want to go to Ecclesiastes chapter two, verse five, because this is the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Some people call it the Song of Solomon. It's one of the same. It's the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. So we know Solomon has got a lot more to add to these things. So I just want to paint the picture more clearly of Solomon as a type of the son of David, the Messiah. This Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 4. I have made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards, and made myself gardens and orchards. We look at that word again, two words, gardens and orchards. And I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools. This is all what we're going to look at tonight. Water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. You can see, can't you, how 
consistent to this, Solomon's lifestyle, Solomon's writing, and it's all to bring us into the garden narrative because the Bible is a garden narrative, isn't it? You know, I, I don't know, coincidences, coincidences, but I got Jacob's Rap Crash's newsletter this week and it's a midrash on the garden. You know, and God's like, well, it's exactly what I'm going to be looking at myself. So it's helpful to read through some of his wonderful insights and ways of seeing the words of God. You know, that's why I do love him so much. But um, so if you've got his news, let's read the, the, uh, the garden midrash. But he's right in what he says. This all goes back to the garden. You know, it's God's ideal state. Wasn't it? And I, I don't know, I could just mention the garden and the creation narrative, and you'd know what I mean. But I just, today, it seems like, no, we don't read every scripture. You know, I spend a lot of time reading, you know, because there's a lot of scriptures in them, and you've got to read the scriptures, not be lazy. And there's such an anointing on the scriptures, you know, it is the word of God. <laughs> it's how God wants to communicate things to us. So I think it's worth reading the garden narrative from the very beginning. Because that's what we're doing tonight. It's all about the garden, you know. And just before, with all the fragrances, Liam was putting the washing out, <laughs> you know. And the breeze came and the waft of, you know, whatever the fragrance is and washing powder stuff. But it was beautiful, you know, in the last few days, the last couple of weeks. It's been gorgeous, hasn't it? Especially with a bit of rain coming and the fragrances, just like a garden height, you know. It's beautiful. You know, and the, it's just gorgeous gardens are. Well, the creator made them, and that's what we're reading now in second in Genesis chapter two, verse eight. You know, this is after. Well, let's read verse seven. And Yehovah Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Breath is the same as wind, which we'll be looking at towards the end. It's the same as spirit. It's all the one Hebrew word, ruach, ruach to breathe. And that's what we'll see later. Shulamites, breathe upon my garden. Oh, let spices fall out. So he planted, he, he, he put the breath of life and man became a living being. Yehovah, Elohim, planted a garden eastward in Eden. And as we know, eastward, in a place before time. It's so eternal, this language, in Eden. You know, it's such a good word. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, Yehovah Elohim made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. You remember these words like pleasant and to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I will carry on. Because it says a river, and that's again part of this garden narrative tonight. It'd be nothing without the rivers, without the streams. Like Solomon said, I planted gardens and orchards and I made pools of water. You know, it's such part of the creation narrative that there had to be water present to sustain all of this. So it says, now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four riverheads. I like to see that as the gospel to the whole world. So the four corners, you know, he's a god of the whole world. And the name of the faith, well, I won't read this bit, but it just says um, in verse 15, then Yehovah Elohim took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And Yehovah Elohim commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden, how many times, you know, we can see, how, you know, what's this word used in the... Powerful opening chapter, second chapter of the creation narrative, the garden, the garden. You need to understand this. God's a gardener. He loves gardens and he puts his beautiful creation into a garden. That's the picture God wants us to see. And it is the picture that we see at the very end. So let's just do in that Jacob Crash technique, go right to the end now, like the unsliced slope, which you did in Liverpool. I think it might be a transcript of that message, to be honest, because they just knew that, or well, very similar to the unsliced slope, the, the Genesis Revelation. Remember? Yeah. Well, this is where it ends up Revelation 22. Powerful stuff. And we are blessed to read these things. Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who. 
do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and it may enter through the gates into the city. You know, this is the destination, <laughs> the tree of life. It's back to paradise. And that is the way as we look at it in a minute. When we get there, when we see, and we've already seen it in Ecclesiastes, but you see it again in a bit, in a couple of verses with the orchards. And it is the word in Hebrew, pardes, which is where we get the word paradise from. Paradise, and that's a, should be part of our vocabulary. You know, it isn't really part of my vocabulary, but it needs to be more. So you know, we need to be people understanding this is our destiny for eternity is back to paradise <laughs> back to the tree of life back to the rivers of living water because I'll just while we're here I'll just read it now while we're still in Genesis in Revelation 22 it comes into it more as we go through these few verses well now that we're here let's just read it see the whole creation and new creation narrative going on you know God put man in the garden it all went wrong didn't it it went wrong in the garden, didn't it? Man fell in the garden, a beautiful garden. God planted eastward, you know, in Eden. He fell. And we see the very end is that we are back. Mankind is back, able to eat of the tree of life. You know, and all because of the middle bit, if you will, is the garden that we'll look at more. The garden or the gardens, the one Gethsemane and the garden where your shoe was laid. You know, we'll look at that garden because that's the garden that gets us to this garden. Man fell in a garden, Yeshua restored, redeemed us in a garden. And because of that, we just read, blessed are those that they may have the right to the tree of life. This is so much part of our destiny. You know, just, well, it was a wonderful time of fellowship on Saturday night, didn't it? Mm -hmm. With uh, friends with Jackie and friends of Jackie's and ours now. And wonderful, really wonderful, beautiful Christian love of the Lord fellowship, you know. But I've got to say, I've never met anyone and pray for this man and his wife and child. That, um, I've never met anyone so really like Solomon in my life. And I mean it, don't I? You know, the man was, you won't mind me saying, it tells you anyway, he was in prison a few years ago with nothing, with nearly not his life left. And then came out and gave his life to the Lord in prison. And then God, it's hard to really fathom how much God has blessed this family. And that's not their conversation. The conversation is all about the Lord. But after we've had an exquisite meal, <laughs> an exquisite meal, we went into his beautiful garden and he took me into his summer house, which is bigger than our houses, which was made of cedar and oak. <laughs> and there was vin, vin, uh, vine trees and olive trees and water features. And I was blown away at home. I mean, I'm in the Song of Songs and this is like living and talking to a very wise and prosperous man, you know, very royal. <laughs> and so in love with the Lord, it's humbling, isn't it? Beautiful sort of thing. But then, and I don't really read it later, we might do, but if we don't, from First Kings chapter 4, when it tells you what Solomon was like, we've already read it here not in this study, when it tells you about his wants of wives and his concubines. But in that same narrative, it tells you about Solomon was someone who considered the trees and he considered things and he considered insects. So after we've been had a walk around to see the palace, he took me to another room, started showing us all kinds of insects, amazing creation, you know, species from the Amazon, wonderful to behold. But this was to my hands, like, wow, this is like being with Solomon, you know. And then that obviously, and Jackie prompted it, got onto the crimson worm. You know, we're going to talk about insects, Solomon. Let's talk about the main one, the crimson worm. But that's just an aside. I hope, you know, I don't know why I just felt to mention that, but it was a wonderful Solomon like night, you know, and, you know, really, obviously, you know, pray for people like Solomon because Solomon, you know, mm. it's a battle going on, isn't it? The flesh and the spirit. 
But anyway, um, so carrying on in Revelation 22, just to, because we're still there. Sorry, I just drift off. Don't I? Oh, but anyway, it says in verse 17, and this is all famous. Let the spirit and the bride say, come. You know, that should be coming out of our mouths, shouldn't it? Come, Lord. Bow, Yeshua. Maranatha. Come, Lord. We want you, we want you to appear. We want you to rule and reign. We want your kingdom. You know, and let him who hears say come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. See how it goes so much back to Garden of Eden, isn't it? In the beginning. Well, this is the new beginning. And it's all because, as I've said, of the gardens that Yeshua went to freely. Freely. He went to get seven, didn't he? And said, no. My will, but yours be done. You know, and he sweated like drops of blood, it says, almost like drops of blood and sweat. And then he went through their gardens and he went, and let's just read it. So, you know, the references, John 19, John chapter 19. You know, it's put in here for a reason. You know, John is a very deep writer. Midrash, if you like that word, is what John's into, you know, from the way it go in his gospel, he starts off within the beginning, you know, he's taking us back to this. This is the creator walking amongst us. The creator came to tabernacle amongst us. He made everything. He is the creator. He came and put on flesh. You know, the lamb of God is the creator. That's what's John, John, John's gospel, isn't it? Well, John 19, verse... 38, I, you know, I've got to read all this because it plays into to what we're reading to tonight anyway. After this, after this amazing fulfilment of prophecy, when Yeshua is pierced so that none of his bones are broken, after that, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Yeshua, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Yeshua, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Yeshua and Nicodemus, praise the Lord, who at first came to Yeshua by night, also came bringing a mixture of meh and aloes. They'll pop up tonight. About a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Yeshua and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. <laughs> and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid. So there they laid Yeshua because of the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. So while we're there, flows beautifully into John chapter 20 and makes a lot more sense when Yeshua is risen from the dead. And Mary has gone to see him, and she can't find him. And she has a talk with the angels. And then it says in verse 14, when she said this, she turned around and saw Yeshua standing there and did not know it was Yeshua. Yeshua said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She Supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, See, <laughs> if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him. And I will say, I feel like we've read this narrative so many times over the last few weeks in different contexts, first weeks, resurrection. But here it is in this context of the garden. You know, the garden narrative is, is beautiful. From Eden to Revelation, and all because of what we've just read and referred to. Gethsemane and Calvary. Thank you, Lord. Really, thank you for just a wonderful way of explaining to us and drawing us who wouldn't want to come into this garden, you know. So, you know, I haven't really started. <laughs> I need to get going, <laughs> obviously. But Gardner said last time, and I think it's important to mention it in Hebrew, the word if garden is gan, gan, he den, gan. And it comes from the word ganan, 
which means to defend. And you get the, the sense of it now, a garden locked mm. is my sister's house. A string, shut up. That doesn't mean it's of no use. It's, it just means it's guarded. A fountain sealed, you know. It's just talking about the protection mm. of this place, the security mm. of this place. And as it did again, say from last time, one of the commentators, Gil, quoting from someone else, he's saying that this is clearly an allusion to a garden near Jerusalem, which was called the King's Garden. And it was only for his use and pleasure. You know, we used to have that in, in Sefton Park, pardon all the fences, mm. was only for the for the wealthy, mm. you know, the riffraff. The, Working class couldn't go in. Sefton Park and the likes were for the people that could afford it. You know, now we take it for granted, don't we? And just, but, you know, gardens, beautiful. And so in Jerusalem, there is, was the king's garden, which was his garden, not for public display. I know I went down that path last time. Uh, capability Brown, etc. <laughs> so on and so forth. So anyway, moving on. Um, Praise the Lord for the garden, though. The garden enclosed. It's set. It's the secret garden, just for the king. It's for safety, as I've already said. A spring shut up and a fountain sealed. You know, and if we just look at the words used, which I, you know, I like to do. I like to just read the words and follow the words through. And then when you see certain Places where it's used, you go, oh, yeah, of course. Of course, this is the language. What else could it be when we look at these words of a spring shut up and a fountain sealed? And I've got to be faithful to my notes and read the scriptures. I've read them through a couple of times. Oh, yeah, yeah, good scriptures to quote. So I'm going to read them. It takes a bit long with them, flicking through. But, you know, this is what the work's been done for. So Psalm 114. And then you're going to see as you read it, you'll see the language that we're back into. It's great. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's Psalm 114, verse 8. Tre well, who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a fountain of waters. This is who we're talking about, Sam. We're talking about the rock here. We're talking about the miracle water. This is not normal water language. This is always this fountain language is exactly... How Psalms uses it, this, how God turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a fountain of waters. It's all of that, isn't it? When the people cried out and God said to Moses, strike the rock, and Moses struck the rock and water poured forth. That's the, all of this is about that, isn't it? You know, when we get into it later, we look at it more with the, Gospel of John, chapter 4, the woman at the well in John, chapter 7, what Yeshua says are tabernacles, and it's all water language, isn't it? And living water, and we'll get there. So, carrying on, Proverbs 5, I want to read through these wonderful water scriptures. Water in Hebrew, mayim, mayim, living water, mayim, chayim. So Proverbs 5, I'm going to get, just give a touch to that Proverbs 5, verse 15. Drink water from your own system and running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. You can understand now why the bridegroom is speaking in this way to his beloved, to his bride, because that's the language there, isn't it? The connection of uh, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth, you know? And all of that language there is all about this, you know, be careful with the waters, you know, don't not to be, it's not for, any, for anyone, you know, a bit like keep your pails before, before swine. You know, this is precious water and it's for everyone who's thirsty, but not to be treated lightly. That's what Proverbs is saying. One of my favourite scriptures now, as we move through Isaiah 12, which has got the obvious 
connection with tabernacles. You know, we'll maybe look at it again later or refer back to it later. But whenever we get to the living waters, as I've mentioned, this is John 7, clearly reference to John 7 that Yeshua uses. But always remember, at John 7, when Yeshua says what he says, the backdrop to it is the man-made water ceremony where it's basically a rain dance, a man-made rain dance, which, you know, the Talmud speaks very highly of and says, you haven't seen nothing like it, you haven't seen joy. If you've never seen this explosion of joy and praying for rain to come at the time of, you know, tabernacles. But it was man-made. It wasn't what God told anyone to do. He didn't tell them to pour water on the altar. But the backdrop to this was, as they were doing this, Isaiah 12 was being sang. And that's what Yeshua is speaking to in John 7, you know, as we'll read. And Yeshua says, if anyone's thirsty, come to me. Come to me. Come, don't do this rabbinic tradition of men. Come to me. And out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So I'm saying things that for later, but it's just all part of the narrative anyway. <coughs> Isaiah 12 is the connection with tabernacles. And it says, in that day you will say, oh, Yehovah, I will praise you. Though you are angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my Yeshua. That's what it says, isn't it? You know, God is my salvation. God is my Yeshua. Doesn't that make sense that Yeshua at the Feast of Tabernacles with this being sung would say, if anyone's thirsty, come to me. Let's continue. Behold, God is my salvation. God is my Yeshua. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, Yehovah, is my strength and song. And he has become my Yeshua. If you think you've heard that before, you hear it every week. Because it's from Exodus 15, isn't it? It's from the song of Moses. That Passover, first fruit song of redemption and the baptism narrative of the Red Sea, it's in there. Yah has become my Yeshua. It's so clearly what it's saying, isn't it? That God became a, a man. His name is Yeshua. That's why Yeshua is saying, come to me. <laughs> come to me. And out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And we're going to see clearly tonight, that's what the bride is going to be like. The bride's going to be this way. It's going to be very full of flowing water. So, verse three of Isaiah 12. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of Yeshua, salvation. And in that day you will say, praise Jehovah, call upon his name, declare his deeds among the peoples, make mention that his name is exalted, sing to Jehovah, for he has done excellent things, this is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. I mean, what a chapter. Six verses, but what a chapter. And the backdrop to John 7. I've said that enough, <laughs> but it's made me know, so I've got to keep saying it. Uh, moving on in Isaiah, I'm going to read the scriptures I've put down. One more after this. Isaiah 41. Verse 18, I think this is back to that understanding, yeah, of the rock is the source. Just please always remember this. The rock is the source of this water. Without the rock, we would have no water, like in the wilderness, when there was none, and God was testing. He always had the answer. All you've got to do is ask, and that's the instruction we've been left with. Don't strike the rock anymore. He's done that once for all. Once, if you don't mind, don't strike him again. Now, what was the instructions? Speak to the rock. And how often do we do it in that context when we pray and we say, Lord, you are the rock. You know, you're the rock. And we're speaking to you. Shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let's get the water going. Let's get the rivers of life. I've got a, you know, the song, don't you? I've got a river of life. Inside, or whatever it is, I've got a river of life flowing out of me. You know, 
that's the language that we should be in, isn't it? These are the songs we should be singing together. And we do, but when we pray to Yeshua, we pray in that way, you are the rock, Lord. We are speaking to the rock right now. Please let the rivers flow. I pray this way, you know, but we all pray in these ways to the rock himself. He is the rock. That's why Yeshua said, ask me, I'll do it. <laughs> Once you realize where I'm going, once you understand this resurrection and I've ascended and I've gone back to heaven, then your joy will be full. Then you'll ask me and I'll do it. You know, you need to understand this, don't we? And when we're speaking to Yeshua, we're speaking to the rock. So this is important. Isaiah 41, 18, I will open rivers in desolate heights. God can do these things. And fountains in the midst of the valley. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree, the myrtle and the oil tree. I'll set in the desert the cypress tree and the pine. You can see where Solomon was coming from. <laughs> he just wanted to create it with the kingdom mm. mentality, the kingdom environment. Mm. Well, we can do this with our lives, you know. We can do this. This is beautiful language, isn't it? And finally, Joel 3.18. In this section of the... Uh, read about the fountain, the spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Joel chapter 3. You know, and without going through all of Joel 3, it's immense, but just the first verse. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah, and Jerusalem. You know, we're seeing it. This is all the Valley of Jehoshaphat. This is all the end time of judgment, Joel chapter 3. It's immense. It's immense. But it says in verse 18, and it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk. And again, I'm reading these things because I know they connect in a little bit to the next verse. So I'm putting it there now. It's connected, beautiful, the word of God. Uh, so that the mountains will drip with new wine and the hills will flow with milk. And all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of Yehovah and that water, the valley of Acacias. You know, or the shitting wood, that's where we get the temple materials from. So it's beautiful, isn't it? You know, again, I'm spending a lot of time in these things, but... It's worth it. It's just beautiful, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Uh, how long have we been going, by the way? Do you know? Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm just going Okay, keep going, Sam. Right. Okay. Uh, I obviously just want to mention this. It's in my notes there, but it is wonderful. Just the connection between Genesis 29, verse 3, and Matthew 27, verse 56, with this picture of it, a, a, a sealed well, etc. A sealed, a fountain sealed, you know, is obviously when Jacob was looking for a wife and he came to a place, didn't he, where there was a well and it had a stone over it. And Jacob rolled the stone away as part of his getting himself a wife. And that's clearly the gospel meaning of Yeshua who sealed in a tomb and the stone was rolled away, you know, as the witness so people could see. He has risen. You know, it's all connected. Stones, mm -hmm. ceiling, etc. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I want to read this as well. I mean, be familiar with most of us here now. Most of you will know this scripture. We read it quite frequently. Isaiah 58. You know, I've just got to say, Isaiah 58 to me, it's got a very strong... Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, feel to it about fasting. Is this the fast I've chosen? It's got a that going on a lot for me, Isaiah 58. But in verse 13, it's clearly about the Sabbath, which you could apply to Yom Kippur as a Sabbath home, but it could also, and that's why we need it every Friday night, really, because it's a Sabbath scripture. And that's why I'm saying it right now when I read verse 11. It's on this connection with the Sabbath and being a covenant people. 
and honouring the Sabbath, keeping the Lord's holy day, is connected with verse 11. Yehovah will guide you continually. Does anyone not want that? <laughs> I mean, come on. The Lord will guide you continually. You know, as in always. And satisfy your soul in drought. And strengthen your bones. And you will be like a watered garden. And like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And that's exactly what he's saying, isn't he? To, his, to, his, to this one who is spotless and has made herself ready and with all the other attributes that she's been, uh, she's grown and matured into. You know, we've seen she's had, she's had time, she's had a moment, she was asleep like the rest of them in bed, but she got out of bed, didn't she? She went to the streets and the squares, she started to returned to her first love, and she became zealous for good works, which is what Yeshua says, as we'll see more next time in chapter five with the Laodiceans. You know, Yeshua's got words for the Laodiceans, repent, be zealous for good works, you know, and that's what she's been through. That's why she's now this. She's come from where she was in bed, not finding him, to now this. And that's what I just think is before all of us. While we've still got time, there's still time to wake up and get about the business. All the virgins slept. And always remember this. All the virgins, including the five wives, were asleep. So I just want to mention that. And I want to just finish that section or that verse with this, which is beautiful. A prayer still in use in Jewish marriages. They say, suffer not a stranger to enter in to the sealed fountain. You can understand the language, can't you? You're a sealed fountain. Your mind, no stranger's going to enter you. You know, it's that chastity. What Paul says, I want to present you a chaste virgin. You know, it's that language. It's still in use in Jewish marriages today so the next verse moving on which is you know okay your pacts mine says but i've noticed in the king james it says your plants plants and in the hebrew it's shalach which comes from shalach you know you know this word shalach is to send out is the where we get the where the apostle from in greek is coming from hebrew shalach so you can understand it's pacts plants sending out, shooting forth, that language is, you know, could be paths that go out, because as much as this is sealed for secrecy and protection on one hand, it's definitely to reach out as well, to bring people in, it's what the purpose of this garden is, you know, so shall I your paths, your plants, and I've already mentioned the word, an orchard, which is the Hebrew paradise, 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 of pomegranates. You know, we love the pomegranates, don't we? <laughs> yeah, the pomegranate was nice. I was like, it was very solid. Wasn't it? Your paths are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits. I think I mentioned that in the Genesis narrative, but I want to go back over that because it is a great word. Pleasant fruits. You know, this is what we want to understand. This is what the beloved is saying to this bride. My sister spouse, come with me. You'll see the destination when we finish tonight. This is all heading to the wedding, without doubt. And your paths are an orchard, a paradise of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, fragrant henna with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all the chief spices. So I'm sure you noticed it, but I said it at the time in John 19, I'll need to go back just to read the Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus section, because it was in there, wasn't it? The mayor, and the aloes, and the spices. You can see it's all this language of, you, you, you are a gospel-oriented person. You speak of Yeshua's death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and coming 
You know, there's a lot of aspects to the gospel and his coming as part of it. He's coming again. And this is what I get out of all of this, these fragrances. As I've said, I'm not going to spend that much time on this bit. The pomegranates, it's on previous Song of Songs uh, recordings, isn't it? But pomegranates, just a quick, simple message on the pomegranates is it's a seed, fruit full of seed. Yeah, seed. And he referred to a pomegranates earlier when he said your temples are like a piece of pomegranate behind your veil. Bridal, wasn't it? And it was here, temples. So we said then it's the meditation. It's that, that part of you that is full of the seeds of, of God's word. But then one more layer just of what these seeds and meditations are in our temples. And where else we see pomegranates around the high priest's robe. And next to each beautiful blue, purple and scarlet pomegranate, there is a golden bell, which is connected to footsteps. And so when we put it all together, so our pomegranate temples is to be thinking about the footsteps of the Messiah, a Jewish phrase for his coming, the footsteps of the Messiah. And she is there. <laughs> She's listening and looking. And so she is an orchard of pomegranates. But there's so much more to pomegranates. You know, and they are, if you just do a quick search, very, very, very healthy. You should start drinking it more or whatever, you know, whatever. But they are good things. Pomegranates is a beautiful part of God's creation going right back to the Eden when he said, look, there's all kinds of, you know, all kinds of trees that are good for food. You know, don't have to, like we said on Saturday, the Jubilee message, don't have to work for it. It was never the plan. Like you had to toil and work with the sweat of your brow. It wasn't God's intention. Provided it all. Everything you could need. You know where we're going, don't you? Back. <laughs> Back to paradise. With a millennium in between, as I understand it. It's the kingdom on earth. And then the new heavens and the new earth, which hasn't fully entered into the heart and mind, but little things that we can grasp hold of and understand, wow, it's going to be maybe even better than the Garden of Eden. But, you know, well, probably, yeah. I don't know. But anyway, fragrance henna, I'm not going to spend much time on, on, apart from to say we've already looked at it in chapter one and the connection there, or not the connection, but the very word for this was henna, was the word kofi. Atonement, mm. so it's an atonement factor mm. that she is exuding the fragrance of. You know, we've said it in the past Second Corinthians two, is it? That we are the fragrance of Messiah. We are to be the aroma of Messiah. Mm. If that doesn't make you pray and ask for these things, what will? Mm. This should only encourage us to want help in this, to ask Him to help us to be this. Or henna atonement. Spike Nard, again, we looked at in chapter one. We saw that in the gospel narrative with the woman who came and anointed Yeshua with said, said the spike nard filled the room, all part of what Yeshua said, which I don't think we really mentioned at the time much. But when you cross reference that account in Matthew Mark, you see that Yeshua says, What that woman done will be spoken of wherever the gospel's preached. I mean, wow. But that's what Yeshua said. Whatever the gospel speaks, what she's done with mentions that she anointed him with very costly spike mad. She anointed me for burial. See, this is just a picture of all of these things. The total, um, you know, being consumed with this message, lifestyle, not just words, lifestyle as well. Okay. Uh, uh, saffron, calamus, and cinnamon. I'm just rounding them up to say that they have got health benefits and they are for mental health as well, you know, for easing anxiety, you know, to help you be a lily, to help you just not worry and be anxious about life and the cares. These were healing and soothing fragrances. And obviously, you know, with saffron, it's from the Far East, isn't it? And that's what these were. The merchants brought these in from all over the world. And that's, again, 
the gospel message, isn't it? When people come from everywhere, all kinds of cultures and backgrounds, and they can look this beautiful body. So look the fragrances. Frankincense and myrrh, you've said so much of, I think, Abby. But let's just say how priestly they are once again. You know, clearly the frankincense, the chief ingredient for the uh, the the holy incense that was burned mm. on the altar of incense, which you always look at as a picture of the ongoing way of the Messiah in terms of he ever lives to make intercession for us through his finished work, through being our advocate before the Father. Mm. He is always making that intercession. And it's an ongoing, and as priests that come, like King David himself said, you know, talking about a royal priesthood, King David said, let my prayer be like incense. I think David just got a, such a wonderful understanding of the new covenant. He was a king, but he knew I can operate as a royal priest. I understand Melchizedek. He wrote Psalm 110, King David, you are a priest forever. Sit at my right hand. A priest forever, according to the order of Melchi, King, Zedek, righteous, mm. King of righteousness, a priest. That's what we're part of, isn't it? As Peter explains, you are a royal priesthood. Mm. So these fragrances, frankincense, and may, you know, we talk about it a lot. We've seen it already tonight in the burial spices. So it's clearly about that message. But you know, we've brought it out quite a bit as of this year. The connection between me and we looked at it on the Shabbat, liberty. Mm. You know, it's clear when you see the instructions for the anointing oil, it's get dero me, dero, free flowing me, and dero is the Isaiah 61, Luke chapter 4, Romans chapter 8, and so on and so on. The glorious gospel of liberty and the liberty that hasn't fully even come yet that the creation itself is growing for, that we are growing for liberty. You know, liberty is me. And that's what she smells like. And then aloes, finally, aloes in that list. Um, I mentioned it already in the gospel narrative tonight, but I want to just read from Psalm 45, because I've mentioned it loads of times in various messages over the last few weeks. Because it's that important, but I'm going to just bother tonight and read it. Go to Psalm 45. You know, if you just go there and you'll see how gorgeous it is. It says in my Bible, the King James, it's on the New King James, the glories of the Messiah and his bride. That's what this psalm's about. We touched on it on the Sabbath, didn't we? Well, without reading it all, you know, it even tells you that this is set to the theme of the lilies. <laughs> Beautiful, isn't it? You know, lilies, come on, remember what lilies are. They don't toil and spin. Consider them, even Solomon wrote all this. Even Solomon, you know, all his fineness wasn't arrayed like them. Mm. God looks after the lilies, dear lily, consider the lilies. And that this music is set to that lilies mentality. But I'm only going to read from verse six because <laughs> it's a, such a great psalm. But for time, I'll just read from verse six just because it's such an important psalm because this is in Hebrews chapter one, isn't it? You know, if you've got the sides Ephesus, you can see that yourself. But you'll know that this is in Hebrews chapter 1, when Hebrews chapter 1 is setting out that God is the Son. And he says to the Son, he says, and then quotes this verse, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Hebrews chapter 1, to the Son, he says this, your throne, O God, is sure as God. But anyway, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. You know, on our getting our oil in our lamps, etc. Remember that one? <laughs> the oil of gladness. That's part of the holy oil. You know, it'll be a great indicator of have you got oil in your lamp? <laughs> Are you a glad person? Because it's the oil that brings gladness. You know, so we need to encourage each other, discipline the way we do and speak to us. You know, our souls need it now and again. Come on, soul. Bless the Lord. You need to remind yourself, soul. You're forgetful. Let me remind you. He's, he's forgiven all your iniquities. He's healed all your diseases. 
He has delivered your life from, de from destruction. Amen. Come on, soul, about time you cheered up and got glad about this salvation. Oil of gladness, you know, it's a big indicator on your oil scale of have you got in? Are you glad? <laughs> Help one another. Let's be glad. You know, singing them songs, I will rejoice. Well, he has made me glad. Good songs, aren't they? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. But anyway, read this to read this. Verse 8. All your garments, you see. This is the Messiah. This is the Son of God, according to Hebrews 6. Yeah, Hebrews 1. All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia. You know, it's such a great picture of the Messiah. And in like manner, he is saying back to his spotless sister, Kala, sister bride, come with me, because you, you smell right. You smell like me. You're a fragrance of me. Come with me. And as I've already, a couple of weeks ago, read the Philadelphia message from Revelation 3. That's what I believe. I believe the Revelation chapter 3 message that the Philadelphians is, I will take you out of the hour of testing. I think that's what we're about to go into in chapter 5 is the hour of testing that's coming on the whole world. And the faithful, wise brides will be taken out at this time. That's what I believe. And so, you know, these are the ways to look at it. I want to finish off with aloes and say this. Because it's there, and I want to be faithful to this. Numbers 24, you know, which might sound, well, there we go. But you'll see it now, because again, it's just another indicator of how he sees us. You know, it's a great doctrinal message, this, on how the Lord sees us. This is Numbers 24, when Balaam's doing his best to get his wages of unrighteousness and to curse Israel, and God just won't allow it. And all that comes out, isn't it, is blessing. <laughs> he can only do is prophesy great things. And so this is Numbers chapter 24, verse 5. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, <laughs> your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by Yehovah. Like cedars beside the waters, he shall pour water from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. That's how God sees Israel. With all of the issues, he's looking at Israel through the eyes of the Messiah. The seed is no sin in Israel. That can only be because of the gospel message, that we are righteous in him. So I'll just use these these words, you know, these these fragrances, these <coughs> these uh, spices, to just bring out other things, see where they connect in scripture, to get the overall picture that this is the beloved speaking to this how he sees his bride, the how he sees us in him, in the beloved. We should smell like him, we should exude all of this. Arrows is clearly, as we've said. A message of burial again, because we've seen it in, in John 19, the burial fragrances. So let me move on and just finish with a little quote on this gardens. Uh, well, we've still got more to say in the next verse, but this is a thing from Gil. He says, sanctified souls are the gardens. Graces in the soul are the spices in these gardens. And it's very desirable that the spices of grace should flow forth, both in pious and devout affections, in holy, gracious actions, that with them we may honour God, adorn our profession, and do that which will be grateful to good men. That's what he's saying. You know, the garden is the believer, yeah. but the spices are the graces, the gifts, the things that we mature into, seek God for, you know, desire these things, be fruitful, you know, it's obviously where this is going, the fruit of the spirit, but, you know, it's clear, isn't it, that we've got to be fruitful and it's got to issue forth and have an effect. So let's move on. It's the same language, saying the same things. The next verse says, a fountain of gardens, a well 
of living water. So we've already crossed over with this, haven't we, in the area? And I've mentioned the same things. I've said enough about John 7 and Isaiah 12, but there it is again. It's this fountain of gardens, well of living horses and streams from Lebanon. You mentioned again, go over that again. But there it is, the living waters, living waters. And there's twice you've seen it in John 4 with the woman at the well, didn't you? Wait, at the woman at the well. And Yeshua said, if you knew who it was, who was talking to you, you'd ask him and he'd give you the drink. And that drink would spring up into a fountain of life and you'd never thirst again. And the woman said, give me that drink. Because <laughs> Yeshua said, I am he revealed himself to the woman in Samaria. I'm sure we'll have more to say with Vicky on Thursday about that. You know, this uh, period of time that was during the counting of the Omer when Yeshua revealed himself as the Messiah to a woman at the well and mentioned living waters then. And then on a bigger scale, more publicly, in John chapter 7, as I've said enough tonight, come to me, come to me if you're thirsty, I'll give you water, I'll give you rivers of living water, will flow out of your belly. And I like to always just say that, like we've already said, the water comes from the rock. And so the only way that rivers of living water can flow out of us is because we understand the Messiah himself is in us. The Messiah dwells in us. He is the rock. He is the source of these rivers of living water. And I'll just mention that some of the commentators actually ascribe that set of words, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams of Lebanon. They ascribe that to the Shunammites, saying it to the beloved, and saying, you're the source of all this. And that's true. Amen. But I've left it in red. I've left it as what my new King James says. And I think the majority seem to say, oh, this is still a beloved speaking to his bride. You know, but just to let you know, people see it differently and deharmonize anyway. He is the source of all the living water. You know, I want to just mention living water. I've already said it's Mayim, Mayim, Chayim, water of life, Mayim. Chaim, living water, and we've already seen it of this year, only a few weeks ago, in Leviticus, for instance, chapter 14, with the cleansing of the leper. You couldn't cleanse a leper without, seri with va without various oh, yes. items, you know, but you one of those vital items for the cleansing of the leper was Mayim Chaim living water. So I'm sure that's a part of this, that this bride is someone with living water that cleanses, that restores, that's able to bring people back into the camp. You know, people that are outside the camp, feeling all cut off and isolated like a leper. Well, the, the Mayim Hayim is vital to bring people back into the camp, to restore into fellowship to heal and cleanse a leper, you need my new pain. And we'll be back in, in a few weeks when we're in Numbers, when we get to chapter 19, with the famous red heifer, because again, with the ref red heifer, it wouldn't do any good without the my cave as part of the sprinkling protocols. So all of the living water is always associated with that, cleansing and sprinkling the conscience from dead works. So this bride is someone that is, can do this. You know, people's consciences condemn them, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Evil consciences drive people away. You know, when the, the Hebrews are saying the opposite, no, have your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, draw near, draw near with a heart of full assurance of faith. Mm -hmm. Cleanse from dead works. You can't have any of that without the living water. And the living water, without doubt, because Yeshua, well, it says in John, as a comment on what Yeshua is saying in John 7, when he says rivers of living water will flow out of your innermost being, John says, and this he spoke of the Holy Spirit. So there's no doubt that the living waters is the Holy Spirit. So, you know, we are 
filled with the spirit and the spirit of life is exuding out of us. Praise God, that's what we should be. You know, that's what wants his bride to be. So I like to mention that in the living walls is just the cleansing aspects to this, you see. Uh, okay. But I, I, where the people have said this is the Shulamite speaking to the beloved, I can understand because Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and a few them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You know, that's a rebuke to Israel. But clear, the Lord there is saying that he is the fountain of living waters. Well, I don't see any, I just see harmony in this. That there's only, the only water in any of us is because he is the fountain and he is the rock and he is in us. And we've already connected the fountain with the rock through Psalm 114, etc. So this language is so biblical, the water language, is It's beautiful language. Uh, and then the next final part of that is streams from Lebanon. I won't say too much now. I need to start moving on and finishing off in a few, 15 minutes or so. Yeah, 15, half eight. So let me just finish with streams. Some lovely scriptures there, but it'll all have the same rock. Going back to the rock again. From Lebanon. And I just did it in the last one, I think, made a few references to historical things we've looked at and the Talmud where it was very clear that in the Jewish mind, the temple and Lebanon was synonymous for a, for a few reasons I might have read, but they were quoting from Isaiah and the like, going, this is why the temple is known as Lebanon. And one of the reasons being it's raw materials, the cedars, etc. So these streams flowing from Lebanon is this language again of just, you know, the gospel message. Lebanon, the temple, Zion, you know, the heavenly Jerusalem. This is where, we, where we're coming from, the new covenant. So moving on, uh, and is this the last verse of chapter four? I think it is. The Shulamite speaking. Back to the Shulamite speaking. Powerful stuff that she says now. Awake. Yeah, a week of north wind and come, O south, blow upon my garden that its spices may flow out. I'll stop there because, again, some commentators suggest that this is two verses, that the first part is the beloved speaking about his own garden and the second part is the bride speaking about his garden. I disagree again. I put this all down to the Shulamite as my Bible does. And I just think it, when she says, blow upon my garden, that its spices may fly out, fly out, flow out, let my beloved come to his garden. I just see that in the language of I am his, and he is mine, and his, my garden is his garden, because I'm his, and the garden is here. You know, I see it that way, but I'm just letting you know. And I do like when it, Read it over and over and I go, oh yeah, I like the way some people split that into two. Mm. And one's the beloved saying, awake north wind, come out south. You know, as in, we're looking at the spirit now, when you're talking wind, you're talking spiritual language, the Holy Spirit, like John said, like Yeshua said in John, the spirit's like the wind, blows where he wishes. Don't know where he comes from or where he goes. The spirit's like the wind. It's the same word. In Greek, it's the same word. Pneuma, like pneumatology, you know, pneumatics. Pneuma is the spirit in Greek and wind. And in Hebrew, ruach. Ruach is the spirit and the wind. So it's one and the same. So we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in this now. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south, blow upon my garden that its spices may flow out, you know, We'll have to talk about the spice scales in more detail another time. But this is where I started to get it all from, the spice scales and how important spices are. And then in the gospel narrative, how important the women are who go and get the spices, unaware that Nicodemus be to it. <laughs> they're, they're saying that he hasn't been anointed because it was done in secret. It tells us that elsewhere in Luke, it was done in secret for fear of the Jews. 
So the women didn't know and they were horrified that Yeshua hadn't been alone. He said, Benny of Rocky, he had Nicodemus took care of the mayor and the aloes. But anyway, Spice Girls, and let my beloved come. That is in Hebrew, Bowie, Dodi, Dodi, beloved, Bowie, come, beloved, come, beloved. And that is the language we've already read, isn't it, in Revelation? It's what we should sound like. The bride says, Bo, Bo, come, come. Maranatha, all that language. Bowie, to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. So, you know, let's carry on. Awake is the language that you see in Deuteronomy 32, 11, without going there, but it's the eagle who stares its nest, mm -hmm. stare up. So it's that, awake, stare up. We saw it, didn't we, in the tabernacle, where was, was wise, like whatever, women, wise-hearted, whose hearts were stared, they contributed to making them, giving their lives to the building of the tabernacle and all the rest of it. So it was that then, that stare up. I love this, it's Uri, isn't it? Uri, 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 wake up, like the, like the, like the eagle. Uh, I've got a few scriptures that I've put there, so I'll just go to one of them, I think. Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52. Yeah, I just think it's appropriate, this one. Away, away, Uri, Uri, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. You can see that in Revelation 22. I missed that there, but that was in that Revelation 22 as well. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise, sit down. O Jerusalem, loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says Jehovah, you have sold yourselves for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. Hallelujah. Arise, arise. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise. But this is speaking to the wind anyway, the north wind and the south wind. And as I said last time, and I really was encouraged if you have time to read the commentaries on Bible Hub, probably everywhere you can find them elsewhere, but I've started to use Bible Hub, and I've found them really helpful, especially with some of these, you know, um, Middle Ages, these commentators, these Puritans and all the rest. Of them. And the way that they are very botanical, and they understand botany, like Solomon was a great botanist, so it's a good thing. And these were, they really had to grasp on what's getting said. And I've never really grasped this, so it's helped me a lot. So I might have to do a couple of quotes here and there to really capture it. And I will, I'll do this first one. And I won't bother mentioning all the names, you know, but there's quite a few complicated ones. But this is what one of them says, this conversation, that's regarding the North Wind and the South Wind. The North Wind, is it clear, clears the air. And then the warm south wind of the, oh no, that's not the one I wanted to read, sorry. There's another better one than that. Oh yeah, there it is. Uh, Kel and Dalit, you might have heard of him, like Jewish believer, brilliant commentator. But this is what they said. So this is cold north and south wind and north synonymous with the cold and the south, as Yeshua said, the loop 12. 55, the south brings the heat. So you've got the north cold and the south heat. And they say, in a real botanist sort of with understanding, if cold and heat, coolness and saltiness interchange at the proper time, then growth is promoted. And if the wind blows to a guard at one time from this direction and at another from that, not so violently as when it shakes the trees of the forest, but softly, and yet as powerfully as a garden can bear it, then all the fragrance of the garden rises in waves, and it becomes like a sea of incense. The garden itself then blows, i.e. emits odours, sweet odours, fragrant plants. And then going back to the Genesis chapter 3 of when Adam walked in the cool of the day, 
in the breath of the day, the breath of the day. And it's that is what the sailor, when the north wind comes and it does a painting job, and then the south wind comes and just brings us into life. And when these two mix, the saltiness of it all, that's when the fragrances burst forth and the garden itself begins to grow and breathe. And wow, just delicious language, isn't it? Of what it's getting said here. Like, you know, it's like you said, going back a few weeks, you can't be insular. Yeah. And like, oh, I'm, I'm doing okay. Yeah, you know, just thinking about myself here. It's like, you've got to be outward looking, haven't you? You've got to be ministering to your brethren. You've got to be reaching the lost. You've got to be, let this fragrance flow out. Let the north wind come. Let the south blow. And I see other things in this, you know, I've, I've just, today I've just come across when I just started to look at the Hebrew words, which I knew anyway, but then I said, oh, wow, well, yeah. North is, we've seen it in in, in Exodus uh, with Baal Zepho, remember that God of Egypt? By the Red Sea, Baal Zaphon, we said then Zaphon means north, God of the north, but it comes from the word Zaphon, hid, hidden, like Zephaniah, hidden to hide. So is it saying this as well? Because south comes from, it's Tamam and it comes from Yamim, the right hand, the right hand. So is that there's something else with this, with the hidden right hand? You know, let it come. Let the hidden right hand come. I don't know. I'm just, it's what's in the words. Zaphon, hidden, south, Yamim. And you can see that, you know, when you were looking at the temple, they the, the, the temple, the tabernacle in the wilderness, the south side is the right hand side. As you're looking out, it's eastward, the south side will be on the right side. It makes sense of the south coming from right hand side. And, that layout, but anyway, others have said, you know, this is all the answer, this is all the language of Pentecost. You can see why they would say things like that in Acts chapter two, when the spirit came with the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And they were saying, until that, the disciples were all locked up, <laughs> and we're all scared. But once the spirit of the God came and the winds of the spirit came, they went out with boldness and their spices went forth, and so I love that narrative as well, because we need that, don't we? We need the boldness. They went out from being scared to boldness, didn't they? They'd done what they were told. On the 40th day of Count Leome, which will be this Thursday, Yeshua ascended and said, wait here until you're endued with power from on high. And they waited, and sure enough, 10 days later, when the day of Pentecost, when Shavuot had come, the Spirit of God, the Ruach, the wind of God, filled them and they went out with boldness like this. So I can see a lot of things here which add up. Okay, so I'm not going to labour this much more now. Uh, so what is it? The north wind and the south blow upon my garden. But that's another strange word, I don't see all the time. It's the word puach which is often used to speak, speak. So that makes sense, doesn't it? Speak, speak over me, do you know what I mean? Us, you know, us, your life, giving words over me. Send me forth, Lord, send me out. You know, he said that to me, there's labourers of you, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send labourers, send them out. So blow up on my God, Lord, that its spices may flow out. No good keeping them in, is it? No good sitting there going, oh, I stink, it's like that. Oh, um, I love the smell of me, man. Like, well, if no one else can smell it. It's, you know, nice one, like, but it, this is that prayer now. <laughs> you know, come wind, blow upon my garden, that its spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden, because I am his. I am his. My garden. <laughs> It'd be a wilderness, like we've read in Isaiah. It'd just be a wilderness without him. He can make springs in the wilderness. He can bring pools of water into the dry lands. But without him, you would be the same as me. Just the dry land. Just a wilderness for the jackals and 
Well, that's all we'd be unless he gave us his life, he gave us his spirit, you know. So now, oh, come to your garden, it's yours, and eat its pleasant fruits. So we're getting really deep now, you know, of course we are, because where this is leading to, you know, it's leading to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so I think I'm going to leave it there. It's a gap getting on for our face. I was going to, well, I'm going to just leave it there, bar, read the next verse, and then we'll have to pick it up there next week. I wanted to finish off with this, but I don't want to rush it. I think I've learned the lesson now. It's like, you know, I wanted to finish off with this verse and leave it hanging to next week with where it all changes. But we'll look at this more next week. But in answer to her prayer, she's saying, let my beloved, let him come to his garden. And then the next verse, you know, ask, <laughs> ask and you shall receive. You know, I have come to my garden, my sister spouse. I have gathered my name with my spouse, spice. I have eaten my honeycomb. Well, there's a lot to be said. With my honey, I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, oh friends, drink, yes, drink deeply, oh beloved ones. And I'll just leave it there by saying that clearly to me is a picture of the wedding supper. You know, I think that is the wedding supper. It makes sense of chapter three. Remember, who is this coming out of the wilderness? Like clouds of frankincense and may remember all that. It's Solomon. It's the day of his wedding, the day of the gladness of his heart. So from chapter three onwards, we knew we would get ready for the wedding. Then Solomon, the beloved, Yeshua, the Messiah, starts to say how beautiful and how spotless you are. And come with me, my sister, spouse, my Kala. And now we've just seen it for the last time. After the verses we just read, Spouse does not appear anymore. We'll carry on for four more chapters, but the spouse was not mentioned anymore because I believe, and that's where we'll continue now next week, that this is now a picture of the wedding supper. And certain people called wise virgins get in, and certain people called foolish virgins don't. But that's what I read Matthew 25 to the week. I don't believe that Yeshua says to the foolish virgins, going to hell, out of darkness, sweeping and ashing the teeth. He doesn't say that. He says that elsewhere to other people. He says to them, watch now, because you don't know when I'm coming. So watch. And I think that is the sort of great tribulation, mark of the beast phase that people will have to give their lives at that time. People are giving their lives now as we speak. We haven't got there yet, but that's the time we're coming into. So that's how I see this. This, this has now arrived at the wedding <coughs> scene, which we'll pick it up properly next week in chapter five. But that's it for this week in chapter four with her prayer of let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. And I think we'll leave it there. Or maybe we'll just pick that up again next week there or so, but I think we'll leave it there. So look, really great to see you. I'm encouraging to see people joining us tonight on Zoom. If you're watching yeah. us on YouTube and you want to join us on Zoom, you know, it's going to become a regular now Bible study, midweek Bible study, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. We're going to complete the Song of Songs. Then I want to get into this one I've been waiting to do for a while, this Sabbath message, how Sunday, uh, how the Sabbath became in Christendom, the Sunday. And I want to go, just go into the historical side of all that, which I will do in the weeks to come, but I'm going to finish the Song of Songs, Lord willing, so let's pray on that. Lord, thank you for the time we've had, things we've tried to study and open up. You're our teacher, Lord. The new confidence mm -hmm. says we don't need anyone to teach us. You yourself will be our teacher, and the Holy Spirit is our teacher. So just commit this to you now, Lord. Pray. You help us to get through this. Pray for further insight as we go on. I pray for further impact as we go on, Lord, that it will have impact on us, that we will all look back at this and go, wow, that helped me to get here, <laughs> to be at the wedding supper. 
I played that. I really mean it, Lord, that it will have that effect on us, that it will have that effect, that it impact on us, that we will all seek this maturity, this completeness in our lives, this obedience, this driven by love for you and for your body and for the people that don't know you, Lord. So much to be done, so much to do. Can't do any of it without you. So I just commit all of this group to your grace, your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for the work you're doing in each one of us. So let the north wind and the south wind blow upon our garden. Let its spices swell out. Yeah. And beloved, come to your garden and eat its pleasant fruits. Help us to be fruitful, Lord. Going back to the way we started tonight, from the creation narrative onwards, the word was, be fruitful, be fruitful. And now in the New Testament, we understand, Lord, that this is the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, that list there, the fruit of the Spirit. Help us, Lord, by the Spirit to grow and mature in the fruit of the Spirit. In Yeshua's name, Amen. Okay. Amen. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Pleasure.